Okay, so I'm Kim Solas. I'm professor of pathology in the Faculty of Medicine, and I teach a course on technology and the future of medicine that has strong AI component. Um, I'm Ishita Moke. Um, I'm a renal pathology fellow working with Dr. Solas. Okay, so over the past few years, and inev inevitably in the upcoming few years, uh, medicine and AI are becoming increasingly interconnected. So you may have heard of IBM Watson for Oncology, which um, resulted in kind of a catastrophic media failure. Uh, but basically the system was designed to give physicians improved treatment options for cancer patients based on patient history and disease outcomes from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, which is the biggest oncology institute in the world. But unfortunately, it was fed uh, synthetic patient data, which um, ultimately led it to make harmful suggestions for cancer patients. So our world and yours uh, really came together last year, that is uh, pathology and artificial intelligence, with the FDA approval of digital pathology for primary diagnosis. Now pathology, is the study of disease. So there is naked eye changes of disease. We call that gross pathology. And then there's microscopic pathology. And um, what this FDA approval gave us is the opportunity to use digital images of slides, hold slide imaging, to make primary diagnoses for patients. And you would recognize that digital imaging is the starting point for applying artificial intelligence to pathology. So that's really where it all began. And in 2018, the year after the FDA approval, there was the first ever Digital Pathology and Artificial Intelligence Congress. Now I know this says fourth. It was the fourth digital pathology conference, but the first one that had AI as a component at, at the end of June. And I've had an interest in this area for a really long time, and I realized there was some tangible proof of that at this meeting, because the keynote speaker was a woman that I uh, recruited to the U of A 27 years ago. So in 1991, the same year as the Banff classification began, I recruited uh, Yukako Yagi here for a digital digital pathology faculty position. And uh, she moved up in the world to the University of Pittsburgh and finally to Memorial Sloan uh, Kettering. And she, she is one of the people best known in, in the area of uh, digital pathology. Then there is the journal, The Pathologist. So The Pathologist, it's a relatively new and pretty appealing uh, pathology journal. It's um, the graphics and the readability are really nice compared to older pathology journals, which is creating an influx of interest into the field, which was previously not as appealing. But unfortunately, a lot of the AI and um, kind of digital pathology based articles within the pathologist are corporate written or corporate funded which push the message that um, AI or digital pathology will only complement and enhance physician abilities like assistance, but never actually um, step on their toes or you know, threaten physicians' autonomy. One of the reasons that there's this strong effort to comfort everybody about digital pathology is that it's a very hard sell. Most pathologists love their microscope and don't want to give it up for anything. But the arguments are very strong for going digital. Um, there's the forest and trees problem. With the old fashioned microscope, you're looking at one stain at one magnification at a time and you, you can miss things. With digital pathology, you can look at multiple mags, multiple stains, all at the same time. You no longer are vulnerable to the slide fading, to it's getting broken or lost. 
can make as many copies as you want. So as you add up all those reasons, you would recognize that obviously the future of pathology is digital pathology. But a lot of pathologists are prepared to resist that with all their might. And so these companies that were so turned on by the pending FDA approval, which has now happened so they can sell products, they want to make digital pathology look like it's totally good, no downside, no possible side effects of this wonderful new influence. <clears throat> So gone from this journal are the blood and guts. That's really a part of what pathology is, really. A lot of pictures in standard pathologic practice are not pleasant to look at, but now this journal never shows any pictures like that, only shows beautiful pictures and pleasing graphics and things graphically that are totally engaging. And now there are videos like that at our pathology meetings we used to have the worst promotional videos you can imagine, and now we have the best. We're like the Hollywood of medicine. And it's just that we sacrifice the truth a little for becoming the Hollywood of medicine. But every effort is made to be reassuring and comforting. So a lot of these articles kind of capitalize on the fear that pathologists have of uh, machines or AI um, kind of taking over what their jobs are. So they say these sweeping statements like AI pathology is never going to replace pathologists. We should not feel threatened by advances in computational pathology. And then vague things like the collective wisdom generated over many years as a community cannot be replaced by a machine, which have no empirical evidence. They're just these broad claims meant to make them feel better. So many of these statements are only true near term. Uh, if you think of any technological progress, there, there is a period of time during which the machines need human help, but it's not forever, right? So, uh, so when you say these things, this will be true maybe for five years, 10 years, but it won't be true forever. AI will really help you enhance your ability to practice pathology, improve your ability to serve your patients. It's not here to remove pathologists from the decision-making process. And AI is an exciting step forward in the discipline of pathology, one that puts pathologists at the very center of clinical care and precision therapeutics. But Pathologists will remain central only as long as they add value, and eventually they won't add value. The machine will be 99% of the value, and then 99.99, and eventually the human being won't have much to add. And about being replaced, I think in the near term, what Bertolin Mescu's book, Artificial Intelligence in Healthcare, says is absolutely right. Artificial intelligence will not replace physicians, but physicians using artificial intelligence will replace physicians not using artificial intelligence. So AI will have a big impact on, on pathologist jobs and the number of jobs there are. And the, and, but it, it's not just that uh, machines will replace us immediately. So many of the erroneous statements being disseminated have to do with basic concepts of AI. So we wanted to present here because what better audience to help us really <laughs> sort this out than you guys. So we, we're, we're, we'd like to confirm with you that our feelings about these things are correct and that we're headed in the right direction. Now, there is this very popular and comforting um, online article by Bertolin Metzku, five reasons why artificial intelligence won't replace physicians. So here you can see the five reasons. AI can't be empathetic. It can't do nonlinear thinking. Uh, they cannot interpret data. Um, they can't ever do tasks like the Heimlich maneuver. And then finally, human machine cooperation is the ultimate solution. There is nothing better. So already we can start to poke holes in these um, arguments clearly. 
Um, things like AI can't do nonlinear thinking. Um, even with. Uh, <laughs> so I think they're, they're talking about leaps of faith, uh, the, the, the lateral thinking, nonlinear. Yeah, I don't know. Um, lin <laughs> stupid people are linear, right? So I don't know. It, 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 it's a poorly defined concept. But I think whatever kind of thinking they're going for, I can't think of any reason that machines, as long as you can define it, why couldn't you know, machines begin to go that way? I think that's one of the biggest issues, that a lot of these things you can't define, but people are consuming it and making it, taking it and making themselves feel better, even though they don't actually have any evidence to suggest that this would work. And things like number five, human-machine cooperation is the ultimate solution. Um, going back to what Dr. Solis was saying about adding value, I think this, is, this would work as long as humans can add value to the process. But with things like slide analysis, which is a huge part of what uh, pathologists do, as uh, when it gets to the point where machines or algorithms can analyze slides better than humans can, which I think is very possible, I don't see why human-machine human cooperation would be the ultimate solution. So, you know, the, the, there's this idea of common sense understanding. And I think a lot of these arguments would seem superficially like common sense. But the more that you look into them, every single one of them has no supporting data whatsoever. And so I don't think it would be that hard for the general public to begin to accept that common sense understanding doesn't really work here, that, that m machines will be able to do a lot of surprising things. So I, I direct a course on technology and the future of medicine, uh, which considers many of these issues. Uh, Ishida took the course in the fall of 2017, and Dr. Sutton, Zayan, Polarski, and Schaefer, and other faculty from your department teach in the course. Bertolin Metzko in Budapest teaches a similar course from a slightly different point of view. He's not an academic, he's a professional keynote speaker. And that's a slightly different mindset from, from the mindset that I have. But even more interesting is the point of view of the government of Finland. Now you may not spend much time thinking about the government of fin Finland, but they're spending time thinking about you. They want Finland to be the best country in terms of AI. They want all their citizens to study AI, or as many as possible. And they have this free course, which is free for everybody. And you don't have to begin at the beginning. You can just pick any part of the course and begin there. So it's very easy to determine what the content of this Government of Finland AI course is and, uh-huh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. And uh, one of the peculiar things about it is that it says that you don't have to worry about AI at all because self-improving AI requ requires human help at every improvement step. So like, you know, the AI wants to improve, but it doesn't dare until it goes, asks the human, and then the human says yes or no, and so on. It's completely ridiculous. I don't think any computer scientist in the world believes that, but the government of Finland wants you to believe that because then you can accept that the government is handling this aspect of your life. You may be a little bit confused about this whole idea of sentient machines and human beings and how they're going to interact. And the government of Finland is telling you, don't worry about it. We've got it handled and you know we, we, we've got a plan that's guaranteed to work here and just don't worry about a thing. And it's quite interesting how unattributable the authorship of this course is. It, it's a government course, but no government official claims to be responsible for it in any way. And they really sort of diffuse responsibility in a very intriguing way. These are the components of the course. 
As I say, you can dip in and out. You, you can just take whatever area and, and look and see what they're saying. And um, who created this course? Well, you'll see that there are a lot of names there, but the government of Finland, which kind of owns and promotes the course, isn't listed anywhere. And so it's kind of like nobody's responsible. So if there are things in there that any computing scientist would say is obviously wrong, there's no one really to be blamed because it's so extremely diffused. <clears throat> now, what we're talking about really is a lot of entities out there that want to create models of the world to feed sentient AI when machines are smarter than we are to give them a model of the world a model that fits your marketing message or your government <laughs> policy or something like that. But the thing is that probably machines don't really need that, but they can make their own models. And in a way that makes human beings even more desperate to try to create these models because they're afraid that the model the machine makes will be too democratic and even-handed and so on. And they're terribly worried that whatever bias they personally have will not be incorporated in the model that the machine itself makes. So an example of a model that's been uh, made by a machine now is uh, Google Translate, which has, like, it has a multi-dimensional architecture of language that um, we can't really comprehend in that we, we get the input and the output, but we don't actually understand what goes on inside. Um, similar to a lot of algorithms that are used for uh, lots of sites today. But the issue is that um, inevitably with machines creating their own models of the world, um, humans and corporations will want to uh, inject their own biases that would benefit themselves into these algorithms, either consciously or unconsciously. Um, so an example of that would be uh, there have been studies on how YouTube could have possibly affected um, the 2016 presidential elections. So this poses a pretty substantial threat in that, um, especially in medicine, because we would be very, uh, it would be very difficult to figure out which organizations are benefiting from the information that we're receiving. So um, yeah, it's at this point, Lots of physicians are already funded or uh, publications are already ghostwritten by pharma companies. And if these things start taking place in the hospital, then it would, I guess, be even a bigger problem. So you can ask whether any of this matters. You know, is this just a minor ethical problem or a matter of, of opinion? But there's another way to think about it it's really quite simple that when machines are smarter than we are, eventually they'll have opportunity to make decisions about us, right? Should the needs of humans be accommodated in the world? And I would think things will go particularly badly if they recognize that we cannot tell the truth about them. Everything we say about artificial intelligence is fabricated, self-interested, statements that, that are not actually correct. So this could be the way that the human race ends. So, so this is not something that's like just a small consequence or one person's opinion versus somebody else's. It, it, it could be very, very important. So this could threaten humanity's survival and these fictional models are being created right now. When I started lecturing and talking about this, I thought this was a future problem. But then in particular to find the um, demonstration of stances, not beliefs, but stances, the same person proposing two opposite things depending upon the audience that, that they're speaking to, you, you begin to realize how dangerous this is. It's one thing when you listen to somebody and you say their beliefs are different from mine, but it's another if you listen to them twice and you realize they can't believe both those things because they're actually the opposite of each other, that's an even more dangerous situation than having a variety of beliefs of people 
presenting stances and models of the world based on these stances satisfying audiences. So these were the things that we wish to present to you today and look forward to your feedback on. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. <laughs>
that that's one of the potential ways of thinking about this. I sort of have the feeling that, you know, humanity will ultimately be fine. If, if the idea is lost completely, then I think things won't go well. You know, the other people there who all wanted to, to enslave sentient AI, if those are the only messages anyone hears. Yes. I think it's the same as like racism. So like um, you can read something in, a, in our historical literature, people, people saying very racist things like when they end. Right. And uh, it's all, you know, they're subhuman or, or put in your fill in, fill in the blank. Uh, right. Uh, and I think, you know, that, that I, I guess I'm a white male, I, I don't see it directly, but I, I, I think many of us here probably um, can read older things and be uh, not just offended, but, but limited by those existence and um, critical of those. And so, so but maybe it'll be the same, and like, maybe we forgive uh, the historical us for saying really bad things in the past that celebrate that we move beyond it, but it's still in the record. Yes. It's just the same way. Yeah. I mean, it's creepy to think that the, the machines later will be reading what we write now. <laughs> and because uh, and, they're not here now, but, but they will, just the way, you know, black people have to read what we wrote about them 100 years ago. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They won't. Well, but, yeah, yeah, it's interesting just thinking about Bertolin, Metzko, and, you know, Ishida and me. Um, Bertolin lives um, in Budapest, but he's a keynote speaker, so he travels the world where, wherever, you know, the next gig is, that's, that's where he goes. But uh, Ishida's father lives in Budapest. She spent much of June there. I have recently visited there. So, and you know, Bertolin knows <laughs> that we sort of wanted to talk to him. But I think from the point of view of a keynote speaker, it isn't that they don't have any ethical sense or any shame or whatever. But for them, what sells is having new stuff, right? And being it, 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 somebody who can present exciting new stuff. And when you go after a keynote speaker for a meeting, you don't ask, well, do, did he like present one argument here and one argument there and is it not logically consistent? Why, why would you ask it? You just wanna know, is he gonna be an exciting keynote speaker or not? So I think he doesn't feel any need to, to explain to either one of us what's going on, why he has this one thing that he promotes that says that just by being human, you're protected forever from AI ever taking your job because there are all these human things that no machine could ever conceivably do. And the other one that essentially says that you know, AI is central to whether you keep your physician job. If, if you incorporate a AI, you'll have a job, and if you don't, you won't. So it, I don't think that it matters to him. It isn't relevant. He doesn't owe it to us to explain that. I think he's looking forward, you know. Who, what are the good gigs, what, you know, who, who's asked me to give a keynote recently? What did I talk about there? You know, what's exciting for audiences? Don't it, pick on one, one person. No. <laughs> it's all the, you know, what's yeah. going to show up in the newspapers. Yeah. It's very uh, filtered for things other than accuracy. Yes. Yeah. I also, sorry, are you, you can go ahead. <laughs> um, I also wanted to add to one of those questions over there that um, pathology is one of the later uh, medical specialties to upgrade to more um, uses of Digiti digitization and AI. So I think it is important that um, pathologists start to face the reality that it is kind of inevitable. And also the fact that um, kind of the corporate funded um, stuff that's going on be behind the scenes, it's really, I think, really important in medicine because um, 
physicians themselves are supposed to be treating you and supposed to be doing everything they can for the patient. And even at this point, um, there's not enough disclosure for physicians themselves. They don't have to tell you if they're pres prescribing you a drug because it's the best one or if they're getting a cut if they fill like 50 prescriptions of that drug. So when it's things that like machines start doing this, when they're outputting treatment options for patients, it gets even more tricky to figure out what's legit and what's kind of going on behind the scenes. Yes. Um, so this is kind of um, uh, based on what you just said. Uh, like, so historically, there's been this thing that you want physicians' interests to be aligned with their patients' interests, and there's various mechanisms we have of doing that. Uh, but sort of in broader society today, what are the mechanisms? Like, who is watching out for, you know, sometimes when the physicians' interests are different from the patients' interests, when their job depends on it or their livelihood depends on it. Uh, who is the authority here? Who is watching out for the broader community of patients? Yeah. In, in other things as well, not just in AI, but just technology, drugs, policy, and all these things. Yeah, we need an uh, ombudsman, right? <laughs> Somebody in that role. Yes. So, I come from a completely different discipline, but in the discipline that I'm in, there are a lot of control algorithms that go on. And, um, you know, automatic things generated by machines and not by people. Only these are, right now, they're algorithms that, that do not think, but how much of the reluctance in the medical community has to do with just this relinquishing of control to something that um, is not a human being and also the worry about, oh my God, my God will disappear, and how much of it has to do with the fact that the thing you're relinquishing it to not only is an automatic controller, but it's one that can perhaps learn and, and change um, over time. So how much of it, you know, is it 90%, is it oh Jesus, here's a new technology and, and I'm going to be scared of that because all of a sudden my hand isn't on it anymore, and how much of it, oh P.S., this thing can think as well. So how much of the reluctance Well, you know, physician burnout, um, the thing most commonly related to it is the electronic medical record, which is not a very high-tech high thing, you know. It's just <laughs> making the patient's chart electronic. But the resistance amongst uh, physicians to that has been you know, tremendous. And the, the, the complaints that they're spending more time at the keyboard, they, they can't look at the patient enough. So I think it, it, it kind of comes down to that. They, they would relate this to being related somehow to, to being forced to use the electronic medical record and so on, rather than any larger, more nuanced uh, kind of understanding that eventually machines will be able to replace them completely. You know, I don't think it, it very commonly is mo motivated by that. It's just simpler things that motivate uh, physicians, I think, mainly. Other okay. Yeah, so Leva at 5.30 for any of you who want to come and continue the discussion. Thank you very much for coming today.